No. Louder. Is it louder? Yeah. Oh, okay. How's that? That's no, that's right. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, what a great turnout. Um, this is the first time that we've um, partnered up with another group in the uh, uh, Kent County area. And we partnered up with the Kent Historical Society and the Chatham Kent Museum to host this event. We're very grateful to both of those organizations for coming together with us and putting on this joint presentation. So welcome everyone who's from any of those um, organizations. Um, at the bottom you'll notice that it said that this meeting is being recorded. Um, we typically do this so that members can go back and watch it again if there's something that they missed. And we also have a lot of members that um, don't live in the area, so this makes it available to them as members to watch later on too. So it is being recorded, I just need to let you know. Um, this is the agenda for tonight. Um, welcome. Um, we're gonna talk just briefly, we're gonna go very quickly because we have a fantastic presentation and then I'm sure you're gonna wanna um, chat amongst yourselves too once the presentation is done. Um, we'll briefly talk about a couple upcoming events that we have. Um, we have some OGS awards that we'd like to give out. We have then our British Home Child presentation, a time for questions, and then we're going to have some uh, social time and some snacks afterwards. Welcome everybody, come on in. So uh, the upcoming events that we have currently uh, booked, actually tomorrow um, yeah. we are partnering again with another group uh, organization uh, in the community, the Chatham Kent Public Library, and we're actually going to hold our very first family history fair. Um, the library has been fantastic organizing this. Um, we have um, flyers at the side that tell you um, the agenda of what's going on. We have some keynote speakers, we have presentations um, about how to use some online resources, we have tours of the uh, newly renovated family history collection that we have, tours of the library's collection. We have a speaker um, coming in to talk about uh, using DNA. Um, we have events in the children's room, so it's for everybody. Bring the kids and come on out. Like I said, the agenda is, is over at the side, so please pick up one and then come on out and see us tomorrow. I didn't put this on there, because um, it just came in. The actual, actually the Bicentennial Branch of the United Empire Loyalist Association of Canada is having their luncheon, and that is on September the 17th, I believe, 16th, Saturday, September the 16th, um, in Kingsville. So I will put this at the side. You don't have to be a member to belong or to go to that. The cost is $20, and they would like to know if you're coming, so you can RSVP, and the information's there. So that just came in on off the presses. Um, we have some word awards to, to pass out tonight too. Um, Diane French and Joanne jo Joan Griffin have been members of OGS for 40 years. And yeah. So I'd like to call upon Steve Fulton, who is the vice president of the society, to present the awards tonight. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, what a great turnout this is, and it even makes it that much better when I get an opportunity to hand out an award. It doesn't matter if it's a year, if it's 40 years, it's to a volunteer, it's someone who is dedicated as a member of the society um, who has contributed. And to that, we want to thank them. And I know it's Diane um, that is here, and we're who's Diane. Okay, perfect. You're gonna come on. Well, on behalf of the Society and the Board of Directors, I would like to thank you for your service and support to our organization. Very welcome. Thank you.
There are other, um, a variety of awards that OGS passes out every year. Um, and we nominated actually two groups this year um, for the Award of Merit. Um, and the Kent, Chatham-Kent Black Historical Society was given the Award of Merit. And I'd like to, again, call on Steve to pass that award to representatives of the Black Historical Society. Dorothy? Come on down. Yeah. <laughs> when I got here tonight, I was handed this bio of the submission that uh, the, the Kent branch, it was the Kent branch that submitted uh, about this organization. And I've read this, and I'll tell you folks, I've read this same story a hundred different ways across the province of Ontario where an organization is having issues, they're starting to falter, there's, there's concerns, there's lack of volunteers. But you know, what these folks did is they stepped up and they got the job done and they believed in a passion and a desire to do the job, but also to preserve it for the future generations who will be looking back. So on behalf of the organization, the OGS, the Ontario Genealogical Society and the board, thank you very, very much <coughs> for your service to the genealogical and historical community. And we would like to say thank Mike. you. <laughs> we would like to say thank you to the Kent uh, branch of the genealogy for partnering with us. We, um, got tremendous help from the girls that come in and that would help us. We are almost there to getting it digitalized. We're hoping by January, but from where we started and where we're at, we're very grateful. And again, we want to say thank you so much. And, and, and we also want to say, if you have the opportunity, come down and visit our museum sometime. Yeah. There's a lot of, lot of valuable information and artifacts yeah. there are impressive. Yeah. Thank and we you. still have the 1934 baseball team uh, <laughs> there. there. That really is, is going well for us. Please come. We're glad to have this. Thank you. So without further ado, we're just going to get cut right to the chase. We're going to uh, start with our presentation that everybody came to uh, hear tonight. So Diana Fulton, she is from the Niagara area. She's a mother of two. Diana is an active member of the Ontario Genealogical Society. She's the chair of the British Home Child Special Interest Group, and she sits on the board as well as the board branch and special interest group liaison. She is also a member of the Niagara Peninsula branch. So like the rest of us, she was bitten by the bug and now she can't say no. Uh, Diana has a personal connection to the British home children through her own ancestors. She enjoys researching and understanding the British home child movements and the lives of the children it affected. Diana strives to honor her ancestors and, her, and hopefully her presentation tonight, the British home child and my connection, she will share her passion. Please help me welcome Diana Fulton. tech support. <laughs> thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for having me tonight. I want to start by telling everybody that I am not a professional with involving home children. I have a passion. Um, my grandfather was a home child, and I want to do what I can to honor him. And telling the story of home children and his story, as far as I'm concerned, honors him. So let's get started tonight. Between 1869 and the late 1930s, about 100,000 juvenile mi migrants came, from came to Canada from Great Britain. 
and my grandfather was one of those. He came in 1910 at the age of seven. Um, there's an estimate 12% of and over 4 million Canadians that are descendants of home children. Now I can put that in perspective. My grandfather had eight children. He had 18 grandchildren, 36 great grandchildren, and three great great grandchildren, and counting. <laughs> um, and I can tell you probably three quarters of them know nothing about home children. And even though like I, this is what I do, this is my passion, my own family doesn't don't know about my grandfather. They know who he is, but they don't know much about him. This is my grandfather, right there, Frederick Charles Biggs. And this picture here is with his brother, who was also sent over. His brother was um, sent over after him. His brother was 10, and um, through his connection with Bernard, their connections with Bernardo's. Um, my, his brother was able to write Bernardo's and find out where my grandfather was, and they were able to connect once they were back together in Canada, or once they were together in Canada. But neither one of them has ever went back home to England. Coming across to Canada from England was uh, a very long um, trip. It came, they all came over on ships. My grandfather came over on the Sicilian in 1910, arriving in Quebec with his final destination as being Toronto. I do have him on census in Huntsville, where it was the first home he went to in Huntsville. And the, uh, the family that he was with, the two farmers that he was with were 97. So there was a 90 year difference in age. <laughs> Coming across, it, it took four to eight weeks. So you can figure a, a ship full of kids coming across the ocean for four to six weeks. Sometimes eight weeks, depending on weather and, and, and that kind of stuff. So it took a, a long time to come over. When they arrived in Canada, they were put in distribution homes, and some were sent to farmers in areas. Some required, some families required domestic servants, and some families wished to adopt the children. Now I'm gonna tell you that all the stories weren't happy, happy stories. Some of them were fantastic. They got adopted, they were part of the family. Some of them were okay. They were, you know, brought in, worked, went to school, and some of them weren't. Some of them were, you know, died here once they got here because they were told to sleep in the barn with no, you know, so there are all kinds of stories. I say my grandfather's was an okay story because I'm here. <laughs> so you can get the um, passenger lists of everybody that arrived in Canada from Library and Archives Canada. It is online. So, and it tells you uh, what company sent them over and what ship they came on and the age they were when they came over. So you can just go on to Library and Archives Canada in the search bar, type in home children and it'll bring you up and then you just kind of go through the pages and then it'll say search the database and you can search the database for all the names and, and so if you're looking for a name that way. Members of the British Isles Family History Society of Greater Ottawa, we call Bafisco, um, is indexing the names of the juvenile migrants that were found on the passenger list but it's not complete yet. We're trying to make a database of all the children that came over but it's not complete, it's an ongoing thing and they work hand in hand with the Library and Archives Canada. You have to realize that there was over 50 sending agencies that were responsible to send children to Canada from Rye, McPherson, Began, Quarries, Bernardo's, Middlemore, Catholic Immigration Society, Salvation Army, and the Church of England's Ways and Straits. And that's just some of the companies that sent them over. <coughs> there are several books on home children, both by distinguished researchers and by home children themselves. There's also tons of pages on, inter on the internet and YouTube. You can go on on Google and just type in home children and you will get pages and pages and pages of things on home children. There's also uh, videos on YouTube about home children. I do have some of the books here tonight that you're more than welcome to look at. Um, they're not for sale. I have a, d a display uh, table only, but I can direct you on where you can get most of them from if you're interested in purchasing any of them. Where to find the records? Census records. If you're looking at census records and all of a sudden you see a child that doesn't have the same name, they're between the ages of four and 18, which is the ages that they came over, you're pretty, there's a pretty good chance that they're a home child. Sometimes they have a different family name, but sometimes they don't, but it's, 
you know, they're, they're not on one census and then all of a sudden they are on the census, and, but they're seven. It's kind of something. So Library and Archives Canada has the most extensive records in the field. So this is where everybody pretty much goes to. And like I said, the fiscal shares what they have with the research with Library and Archives Canada. This is what you can find at Library and Archives Canada in their collection. There's the passenger list, the immigration branch, registry, the juvenile inspection reports, census, and newspapers. So, sorry. The files contain correspondence from, from and to various sending organizations. They often include annual reports, information booklets, and some list of names of children. The files cover from years 1892 to approximately 1946. Juvenile inspection records. Immigration officers created inspection report cards as they carried out regular inspections of the children brought to Canada by various organizations in the 1920s. There are few records dating any earlier, as early as 1914 and as late as 1930. <coughs> and what you usually find on the records is what you see on the screen. Other records at the libraries that a library archives hold, um, you can call, you can inquire at the library and they will help you with what they have in, in records. I do know we were there in, in Ottawa in June and they do have a small section of stuff that's actually not microfilmed, so you can actually go, if you're ever in Ottawa, you can visit Library and Archives Canada and they can help you with that as well. When you're researching online, these are some of the databases that are out there. The Young Immigrants one is, is very good. I've, I've used that a few times with, with mine. But like I said, there's, there's if you go, if you're on Facebook, you type in Home Children, you're gonna get multiple groups that are on Facebook. You have a, a, an in inquiry, type it into the search on Facebook. And, or in one of the comments on Facebook and somebody will answer you. They're very, everybody is <coughs> out there searching or have our professional in it are more than willing to share their expertise in helping people find their home children. The Government of Ontario Resources. The records relating to background intake care of the children were created by the sending agencies, some of which are, did not retain their records. Some organizations such as Bernardo's and the National Home Children released information from their records to researchers who are immediate family of the child immigrant, and of course for a cost. Um, I tried to get my grandfather's records because he was from Bernardo's, and I was told I could not because I wasn't the closest living relative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Printed off the exact same letter, had my mom sign it, sent it over, and they sent my mom's her folder. Mm -hmm. My aunt, um, her dad and my uh, grandfather were brothers, but his wife, his, her mom died, and my grandparents adopted the two youngest ones, um, got her father's. So we were able to use her dad's records and my grandfather's records and kind of see what was different, what was the same, and that kind of thing. And my aunt got handwritten letters from her dad writing Bernardo's looking for my grandfather. So she, there she was things that she never seen. She never seen a child, a, a child picture of her, of her, her dad, as well as my aunts and uncles, my mom, never seen a picture of their, their dad as a child, and I was able to show them that, getting my Bernardo's records. Not saying they all have pictures, but some of them do. Other places to look. Newspapers, outbound and inbound. So in England and in Canada. Um, this one here is in London. So the inbound, there's, you know, this is what you would find in the newspaper, people ad advertising for children coming in, and if you want one, you apply. Then you have museums and war memorials and honor rolls in the um, legions. A lot of the times they'll have honor rolls, and, and depending on what the index, like down in the index, sometimes the star means they were a home child, sometimes it means something else, but they usually, if they knew they were a home child, they had them there. Uh, my husband and I were on a cemetery tour a few weeks ago and happened to be looked down at one of the veterans' stones, and right on the stone it said, was a home child. 
I've been through that cemetery multiple times and never seen it before until that day. So. This is a wartime advertisement. So it's again, it talks about Bernardo's. An honor roll list. This one here, the stars are home children on that honor roll list. The memorial stone, this one's in Peterborough. It has, it's honoring 9,000 children who immigrated from the British Isles to the Hazel, Bra the Hazel Bray home in Peterborough between 1884 and 1923 through the Bernardo's organization. This memorial was built by not one penny of government money. It was all built by donation. The lady that uh, helped do this is a very wonderful, lovely lady in her late 70s and all of she's got an apartment full of home children stuff and it's all paper and she's been ill lately so i'm trying to get up there to clear the, to get the information but they are actually having a a day in october i think that uh they're having a whole home child day up there in peterborough mm -hmm. cemetery monuments there's one in brockville at the old pleasant cemetery and then there's a new one coming up in Toronto at Park Lawn. They're gonna be um, dedicating that one in October. October 1st actually is the dedication for that, that stone. Uh, they found a, an area in the Park Lawn Cemetery um, that was just empty land and come to find out there's, I think they said 56 home children, 56 or more home children buried there so they're doing a memorial. And putting a stone up. So this is the Ontario Genealogical Society of British Home and Child Special Interest Group, which is what I'm the chair of. We have currently just over 100 members, and our goals, our goals are researching and helping people find their home children, honoring the home children. And raising awareness like I'm doing tonight. And also trying to get a list of resources from the UK of what's out there and who we can contact for information. It's very short and sweet yeah, presentation, but I'd like to thank you again for having me. Um, I will be around, and if you have any questions, I can try to help you, or I can try to direct you into where you need to go for answers. Uh, I see in there it said up to 1946. Uh, uh, okay, I was in high school during the war years as well. And there were other children sent from Britain to Canada as well, again, because of the war. And so were the number of uh, home children a greater number coming during the war as well? Or Most of the home children stopped before uh, the war of uh, the Second World War, but there were some that came right up until 1946. Yeah, but cool. mostly, most of the, most of the uh, immigration stopped um, before the Second World War. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just to define that, uh, and that's where the confusion is, is that there was child evacuees from England during the war. So sometimes the kids get mixed up between war evacuees and actual British home children. So that when you're when you're searching in that time period, you got to figure out. It's kind of difficult to figure that out. So I just want to show that. Yes, sir. Any statistics? How many were orphans versus? How many were uh, not orphans? You can, I, I, I don't know the actual numbers. You can find that online. But you can, most of them were not orphans. Most mm -hmm. of them were single, single parent. Like my grandfather, um, his dad died of um, tuberculosis. And so his mom had nine children, couldn't uh, afford to raise them. And so she unfortunately had to give them up. The, the women, um, all my my grandfather's sisters went to Australia, and all the boys came to Canada, except the two youngest. The two youngest stayed at home, and any of them that were over 16 that could fend for themselves, get married, or whatever, stayed up well in England. Um, I was lucky enough, I know he had one younger brother that I have a picture of that was supposed to be sent over, and he was given back to mom. Um, I found out that he passed away in 1974, and I just found that out this year. He was a brick wall, and I just found this out actually in June. I was lucky enough to have a researcher from England stay at my house for two days, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. And at 10.30 at night, she goes, okay, so what family are we looking for? <laughs> um, so it was nice that way. But they, they, I know that this, this 
statistics are online about that kind of stuff. Sorry. You had a website um, back away, so like Dan Jubilation, you were saying something about it, I didn't get it all down. Can you come back to that slide? I think it's one more. Sorry, please come back here. You're welcome. Did your uh, grandfather talk about being a home child? Did Not at all. Didn't. Not at all. We didn't know until after he died. I was three when my grandfather died. I um, don't remember a lot about him, but I can pick him out in a picture. I can look at a picture now, like uh, family pictures and stuff, and say that's my grandfather. The one, two clear memories I have of him. One, he was always eating. When we had a family dinner, he took two and three plates. And we can only think of that as, because he never had enough food when he was little. So he always wanted to eat. And the only other memory I have of him is because I was three, Every Sunday we went to church and we went back to their house for dinner after church and I got to sit on his lap when he told all the grandkids the Bible story because I was the baby and I got to turn the pages in his Bible. <laughs> I'll take that memory. So how did you find out then? My mom wanted to know more about her dad um, and I told my husband to get a hobby and he now has an obsession. <laughs> um, but so I said to him I said we would really like to know more about my grandfather so that's how we started we started just searching and then we found out she my my aunts and uncles had said you know he said something about being from England but we really don't know he never really talked about his family so we started with that his name and England so he hadn't told his wife either nobody knew and he, he never really talked about his family we knew like the one brother but that was because Two of my, like my aunt and my uncle, were my, his brother's children. But other than that, we didn't know anything else. We didn't know he had seven other siblings until we did all this research. He didn't change his name, did he? No. He didn't change his name to people to look after him. No, his okay. name is his name is the same as the one in England. I have been lucky enough um, through the wonders of the internet to connect with family in Australia. So sibling or descendants of the of the girls and um, who is also a genealogist, which is nice. And she has done my great grandmother's side back to 1628. And they had a hole. And the hole were the two boys that were sent to Canada and I was able to fill that hole in for them. I have a full, probably the size of this screen, a pedigree chart of the family from Australia right up to 1628. And I was able to fill the hole in for them. So that was nice to be able to do that. Now we just have to do great grandpas. The problem, I'm glad great grandma's side's done because her maiden name was the same as her married name and they weren't related. No. <laughs> so the last name Biggs in England is like Wilson or Smith over here. It's huge and you just never know what side you're gonna get. So I was lucky, I was happy that they, they did that side. Hans is the easy side. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Do they send children to other provinces in Canada? Yes. They're, they're all across Canada. There's actually, that not only did they send them to Canada, there are a few that went to the United States, there are a few that went to South Africa, and then of course Australia, and there's one other country, and I can't remember what it is, I'm sorry, it slips my mind right now. But yes, they're, they're all across Canada. Like my grandfather's brother ended up at West, and then made his way back to Ontario. So other countries, like uh, say Germany, did they have something similar that could have gone to German speaking communities or Waterloo area or something well, like that? Well, that's the thing is not all home children were British home children. Some of them were from Germany, <coughs> Russia, that kind of stuff. That was a smaller amount. It they used to only be called home children. And then, the, then somebody later on in years added the British home children because most of them came from England. Did the FSB <coughs> you mentioned? Did they mention that the Lucy's were home children? Some of them did. Well, if, they knew, if they knew, if they remembered, then yeah, some of them did. And you have to realize that in in the army, some of the home children decided to fight for the British so they could go home. So some of them fought for Canada, and some of them fought for the British and ended up back home. So they may have been in England, then here, then back in England, and that's usually because of the wars, and they, they, were, they were able to fight for the British army. Um, a lot of people are understanding that their children came as little. My wife's grandfather 
was a homeboy, mm -hmm. and he was 18 years old when he came out. Uh, I, had, I did the research 20 years ago, so it's not really that. Yeah. But, but in one of the letters, a social worker wrote that he had been in trouble with the law, but she didn't elaborate, it was just, and he had approached the Bernardos, and he was sent out when he was 18. Yeah, because sometimes in England, you had your choice, uh, especially if you were a child, you could go to Bernardo's and come to Canada for a better life or, you know, or go to jail. Mm -hmm. sure that's and some of them chose yeah, to come here yeah. and some of them chose to go to jail, but would you rather go and live in a country and, you know, get educated, get have a job, get out of the poverty, or stay there and go to jail? He had three or four brothers older. Mm -hmm. and I don't know what the reason was that he didn't go to live with them, but maybe Maybe they were in trouble too. <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Now, I know, like some people with Bernardo's, if um, they were, if they behaved themselves while they were in Bernardo's care and stuff, they got a, uh, a not a medallion, which I have one on the table. It's um, what's the one I have? I can't even remember. I just kind of lost my mind. But if you were if you were good, you got one of these coins. My grandfather never got one. <laughs> I know that I know that for a fact. It's just the records and stuff that we got from Bernardo's. He, he never received one. He's ran away. When we tracked him, we have him in a census in Huntsville, and then for two censuses, he's nowhere. And then the next census we check, he's in Niagara, where he lived the rest of his life. So where was he during those two censuses? Traveling? Working the railroad? didn't do, he just wasn't around when they did the census or nobody wrote him down. I don't know. We haven't been able to find well, him. They did, do, they did do a follow-up on him. I had two or three reports from social workers, yep. I guess, as to where he was and what he was doing. And, and well, because so on. once, once they were 18, um, depending on when they came over, they were supposed to have so much money given to them and they were allowed to leave the care of the home they were with and go on to, you know, own their own property, do their own thing or whatever. But a lot of them, you know, married whoever it was in the area or the farmer's daughter. That's what he did. Yeah. So. Hmm. Yes. Do you know anything about the Bernardo Cross? I have one. Do you? <laughs> I just found out this, this this past summer that I have one sitting in my home right now. What, what did yes. she ask you? I didn't Sorry, know. she asked me if I knew anything about the Bernardo's trunks. 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 Okay. You can actually go online and find a list of actually what, what they brought over. It wasn't a lot. The trunks are probably no bigger, no wider than this. Yeah, and they're probably a little picture of it on here. Yeah, this little picture on it earlier. Yeah, it's in the beginning. <coughs> and I would think the family, those children who came over in disgrace, would never have yeah. this though. They wouldn't want that. That's not a fair. I know a few people who um, have their. Uh, Families Bernardo's trunks. They didn't maybe not knew what they were until after the family member died. Um, some of them, I know that like the one I have is not my grandfather's. It was given to me. I went to a home child presentation, and this gentleman said I moved into my house in the 1970s, and this was in the basement, but I didn't want to throw it out because it looked old. I'm moving, and I don't want to leave it in the house because I'm afraid somebody's going to throw it out. But I think it's a Bernardo's trunk. Does it, have it doesn't have that emblem on. They they all varied. Some of them were brown, some of them had that, Some, of, but every one of them usually has the name somewhere in them. Either inside of them or on the outside of them or whatever. Yes? Sorry, I missed your, the introduction of your... You, <coughs> you focused a lot on Bernardo. Have you a, a list or a registry of the other charitable organizations that also sent home children? They're all online. <coughs> Um, you can go to Library and Archives Canada and it'll give you a list of all of the organizations that sent them over. Sorry, what was the website? Library and Archives Canada. Yes? Is Home Children <coughs> a catch-all name for all the children that came over? Usually <coughs> yes. Yeah, like I said, it used to be just Home Children and then I think in the 19, what did they say, 1980s, somewhere around there, somebody put British in front of it. So really, technically, they're just home children because they didn't all just come from England. Yeah. Yeah. How, how old was the, the youngest who was there? The youngest that came over was four, and they came as, as old as 18. 
So you can imagine taking a four-year-old and putting them on the ship and not knowing where they're going to end up. They would. They they could be by themselves. They could be with siblings. Um, they don't always keep the siblings together. Like my grandfather and his brother were kept together. Um, and usually the four-year-olds would come over with a group that had like a, um, I'd say a home mom come with them, and then they would drop them off at a distributing home. They'd be at the distributing home for so long. I do know that some of the, the four-year-olds were the ones that were adopted. So did they come over like uh, for immigration status? And then after a certain amount of time, become um, citizens? Or do you know if there's a pattern there? Um, that I'm not sure on. I know because we're Commonwealth, it's just kind of, because my grandfather so was Canadian. That's what's been, he was listed himself as he's Canadian. So, but he's probably English. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, he's always Could you repeat himself the Canadian. question? So we could all hear. Oh, sorry. He wanted to know if the immigration status of them would they be British or would they be Canadian? And I said I wasn't. I believe they were naturalized because when my grandmother went to get her um, old age pension, mm -hmm. she had to provide her, her birth certificate for that. Yep. And then she had to tell them that she was a home child. So they, so yeah, they, they could probably just them. naturalized them. Yeah. yeah. So we were all British subjects until what? Recent years, fairly recent years, yeah. we were classified as British yeah. subjects. So, and I know on July, what's, what's my husband's summer? <laughs> July first for two, two minutes or something. We all are because they changed the flag at the, mm -hmm. at the apartment buildings. So, so who would have paid for their passage? The family that's receiving them, or the yeah, they had to be sponsored. Yeah, they had to be sponsored. I know, um, I know, I do know that. Um, Dr. Bernardo, I don't know about the other homes, but I do know Dr. Bernardo, um, all of his stuff was by donation and sponsorship. None of it was government funded at the, at the beginning. Um, there's a, you can look up pretty much any of the organizations online and get a whole story. Um, if you want kind of an out, a quick out view of all of them, there's a book called Little Immigrants on the table. That's the book I always tell people to go to first. Little Immigrants is the best book out there, I think, um, to give a whole overview of home children. Yes. My father, his parents died when he was young. At 17, he came over on the Montclair to colonize Manitoba. But it, <laughs> but it says that he paid for his own passage. And he could have. Would he still be called a home child? Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's what I, I'm under the understanding that he would still be considered a home child because he's from the home planet. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. That's why I thought they were across Canada. Yes, no, no, no. They, they, they were. They were very much so across Canada. And like I said, there's. 400,000 Canadians out there that don't, that are descendants of home children. And there's probably half or three quarters of them that don't know. Any other questions? Yes. Did the children's parents sign these children off? Is that how they went? Like, I would just show up the house at this Dr. Bernardo's and just say, here, these are my kids and you can do whatever you want. Is that how that kind of? Some of them did. Some of them, some of them signed them in, thinking they would get them back once they got back on their feet, and then they went to pick their children up and found out they were shipped to Canada. And if they wanted them back, they had to pay for them to come back. They couldn't uh, afford that. And then some of them were picked up off the streets. They were living yeah. in the streets, and Dr. Bernardes went by and said, "You know, we can train you. We can give you a better life." And they went that way. And some of them were taken out of the workhouses and the poorhouses as well. The court system. Some of them were. The gentleman that had the one that was in trouble with the law. <coughs> Some of them, they were there. They go to court and they say, "Well, you have your two choices: jail or Bernardo's." So, and my family came from an upper class family. They were upper class, and it was the like the mother had died, and when the father remarried, the second wife didn't want the kids. Yeah, but she knew they were. Yeah, they were, there's they all were kinds of or they There's were, there are all kinds of sti stories out there. There's yeah. all kinds. And they of were also. She was separated from her sister. They were at the person home, and they were told it was best for them to be separated and have a, a new life here. 
and my grandmother once said to me, she didn't really, she didn't talk too much about it, but one day she just came out with it, and she said, you know, I remember seeing my sister get in the buggy and drive off, and I knew I'd never see her again, because that's what they did there. If they were brothers and sisters together, they would separate them. So you were fortunate if yours were not separated. Yes, you were. Yeah. So there's different. And it depends on the organizations, because some organizations tried to keep them together. Yeah. So it just depended. Yeah. Any other questions? Sure. Well, thank you again for having me. the Chatham Kent Historical Society and the Chatham Kent Museum. We wish to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. So it sounds like a few people here um, have British home children. Can we raise our hands and just, if anybody has descendants? So there's actually quite a few, even in this small little group, there's at least 10%. Right. Does anybody else want to come up and share their story about their British home child? We have time. You're more than welcome if you would like to. And if you haven't had a chance yet to look at the books on the side, um, and then some of the folks have brought in some of their information about the British home child, they put it on the other table over there, so feel free to browse and maybe talk to that person that brought them in and you can share stories with them. Um, the one thing I did um, miss to tell you was our upcoming presentation um, for the um, Kent branch, we have a, in October, we have our next presentation, and it's back at the McKinley Funeral Home, and it's entitled Family Connections. And we're actually going to have um, two speakers that night, um, and they're both going to give us a little um, um, information on how to research um, using just the first name of a person, and then we also have somebody coming in and telling us a little bit how they researched their um, ancestor that had a connection right back to the Confederation. So he was a father of Confederation. So it's just a little bit of a twist. And then in November, um, we're talking a lot about the military uh, records here. We actually have two ex-military folk coming in that are passionate about genealogy, and they are going to come and tell us how to de decipher those records. Um, and I actually sent them my grandfather's attestation papers because I have no idea what those little squiggles and lines and squares and triangles mean. So they're gonna come and kind of talk us through about what, how to figure out and read those military records. So that's gonna be a really good book to come to too. Um, we do have branch cards on the side, basically tells us all our information. Pick up one on the way out. Um, there's also some little, um, these little 52 awesome. stories. Yeah. So pick up one of them, it just talks about who was your favorite teacher. So every day, every week, you can uh, you know, go through it and who are you looking forward to seeing every spring? What did you do? What are some of your traditions? So it's just a nice little, it's from Family Search. So it's just a little, Nice little thing to th get you thinking about your family history. Um, again, thank you very much to the Historical Society. They provided, provided the snacks for tonight. And to the museum for hosting us in this great venue. So is there any other questions? Everybody just wants to get straight to socializing and the food, right? <laughs> well, again, thank you very much for coming. This was a wonderful turnout. And uh, we appreciate you all joining us tonight. Have a good night.